Welcome, everybody, to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast Season 4, Episode Number 1. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast created for practitioners around the world who care for people with all different types of hair loss. For those who simply care about the topic of hair loss and find it as intriguing and fascinating as I do, I hope this podcast will be of interest as well. Each week, I'll review a handful of research studies that are changing how we think about hair loss. I'll introduce them to you, help you digest them, and give you my thoughts on how a given study might just help change how we diagnose or treat hair loss. These are studies in androgenetic hair loss, studies in alopecia areata, studies in telogen effluvium, traction alopecia, trichotillomania, studies in scarring alopecia, non-scarring alopecia. Evidence-Based Hair Podcast is produced by the Donovan Hair Academy. It was created for both the new practitioner as well as the seasoned expert. That's a challenging goal, but this podcast was created to help all those who help all those with hair loss. It was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The third Monday of each month will address research in scarring alopecia and today we'll take a look at six recent studies that have been published in the last month or two in the area of scarring alopecia. Let me review very briefly what these six studies are, and then we'll dive right into them. We'll begin by talking about the challenges of diagnosing scarring and non-scarring alopecia by biopsy. We'll look at an interesting study of 100 biopsies, and we'll see that 16% of the time, two experts disagreed on whether this was scarring or non-scarring alopecia. And I'll introduce you to five key principles that you can use to help you with challenging cases. Then we'll take a look at hydroxychloroquine and retinopathy. One of the feared complications of hydroxychloroquine, which you might know as Plaquenil, is retinopathy. A study by Mellis and colleagues suggests that the risk is around 2.7% after 15 years. This is a really important study because it suggests that the risk of retinopathy is lower than what we had um, you know, come to feel was true in the past. A study by Mellis and colleagues in 2014 suggested that after 20 years, the risk was probably around 20%. This study suggests that at doses 5 milligrams per kilogram or less, the risk is around 2.7%. So this is really important information as we guide patients on the use of hydroxychloroquine for lichen planal pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, discoid lupus, and other issues that we commonly use hydroxychloroquine in the clinic. Then we'll take a look at an interesting study of the use of low-dose naltrexone in frontal fibrosing alopecia and lichen planal pilaris. Low-dose naltrexone has been studied before in LPP and FFA. 2017 studies in four patients suggested that maybe it helps itching, maybe it helps reduce inflammation. It was a small study. Patients were also on pioglitazone, and so it wasn't entirely clear, does this help all that much? A 2020 study suggested that, no, low-dose naltrexone probably doesn't help at all. That was a study of clobetazole and low-dose naltrexone versus clobetazole and placebo. And that nice placebo-controlled study suggested that, no, low-dose naltrexone doesn't do anything. So here we have a new study which brings back this topic and suggests that, you know, maybe, just maybe, low-dose naltrexone does something. Small study of 26 patients, and we'll take a look at that together. We'll take a look at a new concept, a concept of actinic lichen plano pilaris. Actinic lichen plano pilaris is this term coined to describe LPP which flares in the sun. The authors describe to us a patient with actinic lichen planus, which are these dark pigmented uh, areas on sun-exposed skin that are worsened with sun exposure. Actinic lichen planus has been known for a long time. It's more common in patients with darker colored skin. But the concept of actinic lichen planopilaris, or actinic scarring alopecia, 
has not really been well established in the literature. So we'll take a look at this interesting study of actinic lichen plano pilaris in a patient with a history of actinic lichen planus. And we'll take a look at a very important study of the microbiome changes in folliculitis decalvans. For years and years, it was thought that folliculitis decalvans was a story of Staph aureus. We'll take a look now at an important study which teaches us that maybe it's not so simple. Maybe the microbiome in Folliculitis decalvans is a bit more complicated than we imagined. And yes, it is a story of Staph aureus, but other bacteria are relevant as well. We'll take a look at this very nice study by Sergio Vano and colleagues. And we'll conclude with a study looking at the use of TNF inhibitors for treating dissecting cellulitis. Dissecting cellulitis is a scarring alopecia, which causes drainage of pus. It can be quite disfiguring in some cases. It majorly impacts quality of life. And common agents to treat it include antibiotics, isotretinoin. But what do we do when isotretinoin and antibiotics don't work? Well, TNF inhibitors are right on the list as second-line agents, and we'll take a look at a nice study from France looking at how well these TNF inhibitor agents work for dissecting cellulitis. Those are our six studies. The references for all of these studies will be in the show notes that accompany this episode. So let's begin then by a nice study from Brazil published in Skin Appendage Disorders from January 2023 titled Scarring versus Non-Scarring Alopecia, an Inter-Observer Histopathological Reproducibility Study. A really nice study. One of the very common reasons that I'm asked to see patients is to really confirm that this is scarring alopecia. One biopsy comes back showing non-scarring alopecia, another biopsy comes back showing scarring alopecia. And the question is, who's wrong, who's right? Well, sometimes someone's wrong, someone's right. Sometimes it's a sampling issue. You take it from the left side of the scalp, you capture a non-scarring alopecia. You take it from the right side of the scalp, you capture a scarring alopecia. And so there are many reasons why there can be disagreement between whether a diagnosis is scarring or non-scarring alopecia. And so we'll take a look at a very nice study which addresses this in a little more depth. So these authors from Brazil set out to study how often pathologists disagree with each other on the diagnosis of scarring versus non-scarring alopecia. So two dermatopathologists independently interpreted the same set of 100 specimens. This was 100 biopsies from 89 patients. That included 77 females with age range from 4 years of age to 77 years of age. And the biopsies came from uh, an institute in Brazil. The samples were serially sectioned and stained with hematoxylin and eosin. That's the standard stain for biopsies. And they were also stained with an elastin stain, Virhoff van Giesen stain, which is uh, a very important stain, which we'll come to talk about in a minute for uh, evaluating complex cases of scarring alopecia. Because what happens in scarring alopecia is the delicate elastin network in the skin gets destroyed. And so if you're ever not sure, are you dealing with a scarring alopecia, ask your pathologist to perform a Virhoff van Giesen stain, and that can help you to uh, get more clues if the elastin network is pretty normal. Then it's unlikely it's a scarring alopecia, not impossible. But if the delicate elastin network is all busted up, broken down, it suggests that something's going on here that could be in keeping with a scarring alopecia. So there was disagreement. And in 16 of the 100 samples, there was no consensus between these two expert pathologists regarding whether this was scarring alopecia or non-scarring alopecia. That's pretty high. 16 out of 100 times, there's disagreement. In three of those 16 patients, 
a, another biopsy was performed. And in the second sample, there was agreement. A nice example of how if you're not sure or there's confusion, you might not just keep analyzing the same sample over and over again. Let's go for coffee. Let's come back. Let's look at this sample again. You know what? Let's, let's close up for the day. Let's come back tomorrow. Let's stare at the same sample again and again. Let's send this sample across the country to another expert so he or she can sit under the microscope and stare at it again and again. Sometimes you need to take another sample. And this is a beautiful example of how in three of those patients, when you took another sample, you got the right answer. In 85% of patients, the clinical pathological examination was helpful in differentiating scarring and non-scarring alopecia. This is a really important point. When a pathologist puts on their report, this is consistent with scarring alopecia. That is not the diagnosis. And that's one of the major points of confusion with patients, with physicians. The last line on the biopsy report is not the diagnosis. The last line on the biopsy report is the biopsy report diagnosis. You then have to go back and listen to the history. You then have to go back and examine the scalp and then take the biopsy report information, throw it into the pot, mix all that information up and say, does this make sense? If the patient's history and examination findings don't match up with the biopsy report, that is the weirdest biopsy finding I've ever heard of, then that biopsy report may not be the correct diagnosis. It's not necessarily that the pathologist made a mistake. Sometimes it is. But it may be that that is not representative of the diagnosis. You may get a biopsy coming back that says, this is a scarring alopecia. And you've taken your punch biopsy from an area of the scalp where your 62-year-old patient fell on the ground at three years of age on a tricycle and had a scar on the scalp. And that's where you've taken your punch biopsy. And you're taking out the scar from the tricycle accident of age three. That's not the diagnosis of the patient. The diagnosis of the patient is four centimeters over from that area and two centimeters up. So we absolutely need to evaluate the history and the, and the examination findings, tie it in with the pathology report, and if all of it makes sense, you have the diagnosis. So a really nice study in skin appendage disorders. I leave you with these points, and that is that for tougher cases, where there's disagreement, where there's confusion, remember, there's five things you can do at any time. You can take more cuts. You can do more stains, you can do more biopsies, you can do more of a history, and you can spend more time examining the patient. So you can do more cuts. In other words, you can ask your pathologist to go back to the block and take more cuts. Is there something else that you're missing? If you take more cuts, is there features of the diagnosis if you take more cuts? This is sometimes more relevant when you take uh, vertical sections than horizontal sections, but can be relevant for both. In vertical sections, it may be that the pathologist says, this is a non-scarring alopecia. And then you do more and more cuts in the block and you find, wow, in these other cuts, we're seeing some lichenoid change. We're seeing necrosis of keratinocytes. This is suggestive of lichen plano pilaris. We didn't see that in the first cuts. You can do more stains. This is point number two. The elastin stain is very helpful in challenging cases. And our pathology group uh, often does elastin stains for us, and it's really helpful. In challenging cases where I think this is a scarring alopecia, and the pathologist says, I don't see any evidence of scarring alopecia. And I give them a call, and I say, I think this is a scarring alopecia. And they say to me, I don't think this is a scarring alopecia. I'll say to them, or they'll say to me, let's do an elastin stain. And if the elastin stain comes back perfectly normal, sebaceous glands are preserved, 
then I'm a little bit more likely to feel, okay, I thought it was a scarring alopecia, but I'm willing to admit here that we're not really having much evidence. There's no, no lichenoid change. There's no necrosis of keratinocytes. Sebaceous glands are preserved. The elastin network is, is present and not disturbed at all. Not really in keeping with a scarring alopecia. Now, it might be that I biopsied a site that's not representative. Uh, so we need to consider that all the time. The other stains that we can consider are direct immunofluorescence. And sometimes DIF can be helpful in some complex autoimmune issues to evaluate the types of immunostains that can be present. The third is more biopsies. Don't be afraid to take more biopsies in challenging cases. I think that's really important. And sometimes when there's a really challenging case, I will say to patients, listen, I think we're going to take two biopsies. This site here is just a little bit different than this site over here. And so in really complex, challenging cases where the presentation is not classic, this just seems a little different, we might take two biopsies. We might take more history if you're confused. So I think taking more history is really important. Asking about, you know, how exactly did this start? What were the symptoms like? What was the itching? What was the burning like? What was the shedding like? How, what was the response to treatment? Um, this hair loss that you had, did it follow a surgery? Did it follow a highly stressful event in your life? Did it follow the initiation of a medication? Taking more history is sometimes very helpful. And then finally examining the scalp, examining the eyebrows examining the eyelashes, examining the nails, examining the arm hair and the leg hair. You know, sometimes that's really important. You see a patient with a red scalp, and the patient says, you know, I've had, I'm having trouble with my shampoos. They're all irritating me. And um, I had patch testing done, and there's some allergens, we're not sure. I think I have allergy to something in my shampoos. I'd like your advice on, you know, how to deal with this red scalp. And so you, you listen to the story, you examine the, the scalp, you examine the patient, you look at all the information, and you're really not sure the biopsies was from an area that doesn't seem representative of the red scalp. It was taken from the back to hide the scar. The patient didn't want to have a scar in the scalp, so they had a biopsy from way in the back. That's not really where it's red. And then you examine the patient, and you find that they have a facial rash. They have a rash around the eyelids. You see the nails are red. The cuticles are red. You use your trichoscope to look at the nail fold capillaries, and you see they're dilated. You notice that there's other types of rashes on the neck and the chest, which has been thought to be the allergy from the shampoo running down the neck, running down the back. And you realize this is dermatomyositis. And so in complex cases, take more history, examine the patient, do more biopsies, ask for more stains, do more cuts. These are five key principles that can really help you in challenging cases, and they work really well. And it might not be that all five are needed. It might be that one of these is needed, but those five principles go a long, long way. But remember that a biopsy result it's just a biopsy result. That last line on the biopsy is the biopsy diagnosis. It's not the final diagnosis of the patient. You need to go back and listen to the history and examine the patient, then mix the biopsy result into that. Mix it up in your mixing pot and figure out, does this all make sense? And if it makes sense, you have a diagnosis. If it doesn't make sense, then you go back you do more cuts, more biopsies, more history, more stains, more examination. So let's go on now to talk about hydroxychloroquine, which you might know as Plaquenil, and the risk for retinopathy, a study from 2023 by Mellis and colleagues. Mellis and colleagues are a group that has studied hydroxychloroquine risk in retinopathy for quite some time. And so they're a leader in this area of eye disease when it comes to hydroxychloroquine. 
Why are we talking about hydroxychloroquine? Well, hydroxychloroquine is an important medication for those who treat certain types of hair loss, including lichen plano pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, discoid lupus, pseudopelod, lupus, dermatomyositis. And one of the feared complications of hydroxychloroquine is retinopathy. This so-called bullseye retinopathy, which can rarely lead to permanent vision loss. And one of the key questions is, how common is this? In a study from 2014 by Mellis and Marmor, the same author as this 2023 study, was a very important study that was published in JAMA Ophthalmology. And that study suggested that with use of four to five milligram per kilogram dosing, the prevalence of retinal toxicity was about 2% in the first 10 years, but it rose to 20% after 20 years of use. And that was a really important study in 2014 because that helped shape some of the guidelines of the ophthalmology literature, the rheumatology literature, the dermatology literature, clinicians that use hydroxychloroquine. And what came from this 2014 study was that, okay, the risk is pretty low in the first several years, but then it rises later. And so the recommendations were that everyone should have a screening examination at the start. And then if you have low risk for retinopathy, then perhaps you can do annual examinations starting five years later. So it was a really important study. But what was troublesome in this 2014 study was that Yes, the risk is 1% in 5 years, 2% in 10 years. It rises to 20% at 20 years. So one out of every five of your patients, if they're on hydroxychloroquine long enough, are going to have some type of retinopathy. That's concerning. <clears throat> but nevertheless, the guidelines were to keep it 5 milligrams per kilogram or less. But now Mellis and colleagues come back to look at the long-term risk for hydroxychloroquine in a in a group of patients, a so-called real-world study. And these were patients 18 years of age or over who had received hydroxychloroquine for five or more years. Patients were receiving hydroxychloroquine for many different indications, rheumatoid arthritis, various inflammatory autoimmune diseases, lupus, Sjogren's, other connective tissue diseases, other dermatologic issues. There was 3,325 patients in the study. 18% were using more than 6 milligrams per kilogram, more than the recommended dose of the new guidelines. 16% were using between 5 and 6 milligram per kilogram, and 65% were using 5 milligram per kilogram or less. So how common was retinopathy? Well, in those using less than 5 milligrams per kilogram, the risk was 1.2% at 10 years and 2.7% at 15 years. Those are patients using the currently recommended doses. How common was moderate to severe retinopathy? Well, it was 1.1% after 15 years of use. That's a really important number. Not all patients with retinopathy go on to develop vision loss but certainly those with moderate to severe retinopathy are at the greatest risk. And so after 15 years, that risk is around 1%. So the authors remind us that most cases of retinopathy in this study were mild, typically asymptomatic. The, the bullseye retinopathy, which we worry about and we all learn about, was quite rare. So the authors point out that the long-term risk for retinopathy was lower than their estimates from their 2014 study. So not lower than the risk of someone else's study, but lower than the risk of their own study in 2014. And so the authors point out that most cases are, are, are asymptomatic and they're unlikely to progress to severe retinopathy after the hydroxychloroquine is withdrawn. So retinopathy is certainly a risk Vision loss is certainly a risk, 
But the authors point out here that if the doses are kept 5 milligrams per kilogram or less, and guidelines are followed, in other words, patients have screening, and then they're followed again at five years, if they have risk factors, meaning they're slightly older, they have other issues related to the kidney or the liver, or they're on certain medications that maybe they need annual examination. But all in all, if one follows these guidelines, the risk of vision loss should be quite rare. So I think that's really important. All patients starting hydroxychloroquine need to have some sort of a eye examination to rule out any pre-existing eye disease. And then annual screening can begin at year five for those on five milligrams per kilogram or less and those who don't have any risk factors. So what are the risk factors that increase the risk for toxicity from hydroxychloroquine? Well, longer dose, the risk after 15 years is higher than at 10 years. Patients on higher doses, we've learned that patients on six milligrams per kilogram have a higher risk of retinopathy than those on five milligrams per kilogram. Patients with kidney disease and liver disease may have an increased risk of toxicity depending on the severity of that kidney and liver disease. Patients over 60 to 65 years of age have slightly increased risk. Those with pre-existing retinal disease and those on tamoxifen therapy. These are the groups of patients with which may be at increased risk of hydroxychloroquine toxicity. That doesn't mean you can't start a 60-year-old patient on hydroxychloroquine. Not at all. It just means that if you have a 60-year-old patient with several eye diseases and liver dysfunction, you may think twice and ask if there's another medication, or you simply may monitor them more closely. You're not going to start them on hydroxychloroquine, send them for screening, and say, come back at five years. We'll see you at, on your 65th birthday, and we'll do your next examination. No, you might follow those patients yearly or twice a year, depending on what the eye doctor says. And so everything needs to be taken into account with the clinical history, but those are the important risk factors for hydroxychloroquine toxicity. So keep the dose less than five milligrams per kilogram. A nice study which we reviewed on the Evidence-Based Hair podcast in July 2022 by Chen and colleagues reminds us that even though these guidelines exist for keeping the dose five milligrams per kilogram or less, and even though sometimes there's electronic pharmacy databases that help guide the dose and remind people to keep the dose at, at the correct level, there's still a lot of errors that go on. And there's many, many patients that walk through the doors of my office that are not on the correct dose. Many of us feel that the dose of hydroxychloroquine is 400 milligrams a day, 200 milligrams twice a day. Well, that's not the correct dose. 400 milligrams daily is the correct dose for someone 180 pounds or higher. But if you have a patient who's 120 pounds, 400 milligrams per day is not the correct dose. That's overdosing on hydroxychloroquine. If you have a patient 120 pounds, the dose might be 20, 200 milligrams a day, Monday to Friday, and then 400 milligrams on the weekend. That would be the five milligram per kilogram dose. But remember, you don't have to start the, the maximum dose. And so if I have a patient who's 120 pounds, and I realize that the 5 milligram per kilogram dose is 200 milligrams Monday to Friday and 400 milligrams on the weekend, I might just say start 200 milligrams a day. We're just under the 5 milligram per kilogram dose, which is great. These can still be helpful if they're going to be helpful. We don't have to push the dose. I might say take 200 milligrams Monday to Friday. Let's see what happens. So you don't have to push the dose maximally to 5 milligrams per kilogram. If a patient is doing well with their scarring alopecia on topical steroids, steroid injections, topical tacrolimus, low-dose naltrexone, but you feel 
we need something else. I need a little more help. I don't know that I need a lot more help, but I need more help with this scarring alopecia. Then you might start in a patient 200 milligrams three times a week. You don't have to start daily. And so it's important to respect the dosing guidelines, but remember you don't have to push the maximum dose. So we leave hydroxychloroquine and we turn now to low-dose naltrexone, a study Oral low-dose naltrexone in the treatment of frontal fibrosing alopecia and lichen planopilaris, an uncontrolled, open-label perspective study. A study from 2023, and the term uncontrolled is really an important term here. There's no control group in this particular study. Naltrexone is FDA-approved to treat opioid dependence and alcohol use disorder at doses 50 to 100 milligrams per day. And so the reason these pills sit in the pharmacy at 50 milligram doses is that is the dose for opioid addiction or uh, alcohol use disorder. We don't use 50 milligram doses in the treatment of autoimmune diseases. We use lower doses. And those lower doses are referred to as low-dose naltrexone. And so any dose from... 0.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams or 6 milligrams is called low-dose naltrexone. And low-dose naltrexone over the last 20 years has shown itself to have an impact on immune function. Low-dose naltrexone can increase endogenous opioids as well as modulate the immune system in certain ways. It can exert anti-inflammatory effects through its antagonism of toll-like receptor 4. And so it was approved in 1984 for opioid addiction at a dose of 50 milligrams. And in the past 20 years, it has been studied in various autoimmune diseases. In 2017, a study by Strazula and colleagues reported four patients, three with LPP, one with FFA, and showed that low-dose naltrexone could help itching and could help inflammation. That was a small study. Patients were also started on pioglitazone at the same time in three of those four patients. And so it wasn't entirely clear what was the role of low-dose naltrexone in these patients. Lajvardi published a very nice study in 2020, which was a study which involved a placebo group. It was a randomized controlled trial and in that 2020 study, there was two groups. Half the group received clobetazole with low-dose naltrexone. The other half received clobetazole with placebo. And they evaluated the changes in disease activity at two-month intervals. And in the clobetazole with low-dose naltrexone group, the LPP activity index decreased 25.6%. So there was an improvement in scarring alopecia disease activity. In the group receiving clobetazole and placebo, the LPP disease activity decreased about the same. And so the conclusion here was that the addition of low-dose naltrexone didn't really do much more than clobetazole. And so it suggested that low-dose naltrexone was not really having much of a benefit in this study of 34 patients. So we have two studies. We have Strazula and colleagues suggesting that low-dose naltrexone might do something at 3 milligrams. It might reduce inflammation. It might reduce itching. We have Lajvardi study in 2020 suggesting that it doesn't do anything. So now we have Hamill. Now we have Hamill and colleagues. This was a study of adults 18 years of age or over at Washington University Dermatology Clinics. Patients had LPP or FFA, and they were seen by a dermatologist at baseline, and then at 3 months, 6 months, 12 months. And the same investigator adjust, uh, assessed the clinical response. At each visit, data was collected regarding itching and burning, perifollicular erythema, perifollicular scale, the scalp involvement. If they had FFA, the distance from the glabella to the frontal hairline was measured. If they had LPP, the square centimeter area of the LPP was measured as well. 
adverse events were recorded. Patients were allowed to continue their treatments during the study period. So if you had started hydroxychloroquine, you could stay on it. If you started clobetazole, you could stay on it. If you started the wonderful first-line agent for FFA, finasteride or dutasteride or isotretinoin, you could stay on it. But you couldn't start any new treatments. And we'll come back to why that's important. And so between September and December 2019, there was 43 patients enrolled to start 3 milligrams daily. 26 out of those 43 patients, that's 60% of patients, took the low-dose naltrexone for 12 months. So not all 43 patients completed the study, but 26 patients did. The mean age was 65 years, 95% of patients were white, and in the original group of 43, 81% had FFA, 14% had LPP, and 5% had LPP and FFA. So most patients had FFA. So how did patients do? Well, when you compare the data at 12 months compared to the data at the start, there was no real change in itching, burning, or scaling. There was a difference in perifollicular redness. And so on a three-point scale, the amount of redness reduced by one point. And this is important because we know that perifollicular redness is a sign of disease activity and progression. Toledo Pastrana and colleagues published a nice study in the International Journal of Trichology, which we should all know about, titled Perifollicular Erythema as a Trichoscopy Sign of Progression in Frontal Fibrosing Alopecia. And that study and others that followed remind us that perifollicular erythema is a sign of disease activity. And so in this study, Low-dose naltrexone at 3 milligrams reduced perifollicular erythema. The authors noted that the frontal hairline was stable during this 12-month study period. We're not actually given the measurements. And we're not given any data for LPP, how many square centimeters it was before and after, how things changed. So that's omitted from the results. So even though itching, burning, and scaling were no different, at the beginning versus 12 months, there did appear to be some benefits a few months into treatment. There was an improvement in burning at the six month mark, and there was an improvement in scaling at the three month mark and the six month mark, but then those benefits waned. And so at 12 months, there really didn't seem to be any clear benefit anymore for burning or itching or scaling, but there was for perifollicular redness. What about side effects? So 41% of patients had side effects. So I think that's important. That means almost one out of every two people that you prescribe low-dose naltrexone to will have side effects. I think that's really important. I think that low-dose naltrexone is currently being used um, quite liberally which is in some ways okay if there's no contraindications and patients understand the side effects and patients agree to it. But there are side effects with low-dose naltrexone. They're generally not serious, but sleep disturbances are not uncommon. And so the most common reasons that a, that a patient with on low-dose naltrexone picks up the phone and calls us is sleep disturbance. That may be vivid dreams that they don't like, some patients have vivid dreams on low-dose naltrexone that they like. But some patients have vivid dreams that they don't like. And some patients can't sleep. And so sometimes we change to lower doses. Sometimes we change to dosing in the morning. Headaches can be seen. Other side effects can be seen as well. But almost one out of every two patients are going to have some kind of side effect. So a study here suggesting to us that low-dose naltrexone might do something in frontal fibrosing alopecia. Maybe LPP as well, although most patients in this study had FFA. So Strzula's study from 2017 suggested that low-dose naltrexone might help. Lajvardi's 2020 study suggested that it doesn't do much. 
And so here we have a study again suggesting that, hey, it might help. I think the message here is we really don't know fully, but it just might do something, and it's worth continuing to study the benefits of low-dose naltrexone. Generally a well-tolerated treatment and an inexpensive treatment. A um, low-dose naltrexone pills when dissolved in water or orange juice and drawn up with a syringe each day you know, could be $100 a year. Um, the use of a JAK inhibitor in uh, uh, LPP or FFA um, could be $20,000, $30,000 a year. So $30,000 a year versus $100 a year. Now, I'm not saying here that um, the two are equivalent, but it is important to remember that low-dose naltrexone is inexpensive and it's relatively safe. It does have side effects, but they're generally mild in most patients. And so if a patient's doing really well on steroid injections, um, dutasterides, um, topical pimecrolimus, and we just feel there's a little bit more help that's needed, uh, there's this redness in the scalp that I'd like to get rid of, there's, there's just a little bit of disease activity. I, I don't know what I want to do. I don't really want to start methotrexate. I don't want to start isotretinoin, I don't want to start so-and-so and so-and-so -so medication because the patient doesn't have drug coverage. Maybe I'll start low-dose naltrexone. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but it's going to be relatively inexpensive. I can start at a very low dose, one or two milligrams, and titrate up, and we'll see what happens. Not a bad idea in some cases. Of course, every medication can only be prescribed with a proper history, proper examination, proper uh, counseling on risks and benefits and contraindications. But this is an interesting study which suggests to us that let's keep the discussion of low-dose naltrexone going. One study suggests it works. One study suggests it's useless. We have another study suggesting it works. Let's keep the discussion going. It's a small study, 26 patients. It's an uncontrolled study. We don't really know if this benefit in the reduction in redness was due to the drug. It could be that many of these patients, just before coming in to enroll in the study, just started hydroxychloroquine, or they just started dutasteride, or they just started doxycycline. So it might be that the drugs they were on before is the entire reason why their redness reduced. We don't know. It's an uncontrolled study. So we need to keep that in mind. And we always have to keep in mind with studies of scarring alopecia that one year is a short time. So when someone says to me, my hairline's been stable for one year, what do you think? Is it, is it burnt out, doc? No, not necessarily. It could be that the hairline is stable for 12 months. When you take a ruler and measure from the gobella to the hairline, that's seven centimeters in 2019. It's seven centimeters in 2020. But there's been removal of hairs, there's been loss of eyebrows, the sideburns have been moving back, back, back. The hairline's still 12, 7 centimeters, but the hairline's moving back at the sideburns. There used to be arm hair in 2019, now it's gone. There used to be leg hair, now it's gone. That's active scarring alopecia. I don't care what the measurement is from the gobella to the hairline. Hairs are being removed actively from the scalp, so you can keep measuring the hairline distance all you want, but you're not getting an accurate picture of the disease activity. So everything has to be taken into context. So when we measure the activity of FFA, yes, we want to measure the distance from the gobella to the hairline. That's really helpful. But we want to look at pictures of the sideburns. We want to look at pictures of the top of the scalp. We want to ask about itching, burning, and pain. We want to ask about eyebrow hair, eyelash hair, underarm hair, pubic hair, arm hair, leg hair. We want to ask about the nails. We want to ask about other aspects of the immune system. A patient with, um, you know, fairly stable um, scarring alopecia of the scalp, but who has now developed, you know, sicker syndromes with dry eyes, dry mouth, 
or fairly stable hair, but has now developed autoimmune thyroiditis. Patient with fairly stable hair who has now developed, you know, pebbling of the face with facial papules. These are all indications to me that, okay, maybe the hairline is stable, but the immune system might not be. And so I'm a little more concerned about these patients. But nevertheless, this study of 26 patients is important because it reminds us that low-dose naltrexone might do something. We need more studies, and especially studies with a control group, and we need studies which follow patients a little bit longer. It's not easy to drag studies out to two years, three years, four years. That's expensive. It takes time. People don't do that. Our studies in the hair loss world last 24 weeks, 52 weeks, two years. Those are typical studies. If you have studies that are lasting three years, four years, that's a really long time, but that's really important in scarring alopecia. Photographs are really helpful, not only to look at the frontal hairline, but as I mentioned, other areas of the scalp as well. And in this particular study, 14% of patients had LPP. We don't really have much data in this study for LPP, uh, and so it's hard to draw conclusions in this study about LPP. Uh, largely, it was a study of FFA. So we move now to talk about a potentially new form of scarring alopecia called actinic lichen planopilaris, or sun-related lichen planopilaris. And the title of the article is Actinic Lichen Planopilaris, a new variant of lichen planopilaris triggered by ultraviolet radiation. So the authors of this study report a new subtype, potentially, of lichen planopilaris called actinic LPP. I think we have to be careful about how we use this term, and I'll walk you through it. Um, a patient that says, you know, come to think of it, my lichen Plano pilaris kind of worsened last summer. Um, it may not be appropriate to call that actinic lichen plano pilaris. I think we'll see over time how we use this term. Ultraviolet radiation certainly can activate lichen plano pilaris. Stress can activate lichen plano pilaris. Vaccination can activate lichen plano pilaris. So there are many triggers that can activate this scarring alopecia. When we use the term actinic lichen planopilaris, as we'll see, it usually refers to a patient with darker skin type and a patient with a predisposition to develop actinic lichen planus of the skin. And we'll walk through that. So the authors report a 39-year-old woman of Sri Lankan background. She had Fitzpatrick type 5 skin, darker colored skin, and she presented with a three-year history of itchy, hyperpigmented plaques affecting sun-exposed sites of the face, top of the hands, feet, and punch biopsies confirmed that those darker plaques on the sun-exposed skin were lichen planus. And lichen planus is this rash which is a close cousin of lichen planopilaris. Lichen planus is much, much more common of an issue in the dermatology world than is lichen planopilaris. Lichen planus might affect 1% or so of patients. Lichen planopilaris affects probably one out of every 2,000 patients. And so this patient was treated with Mometazone ferroate topical steroid ointment, the calcineurin inhibitor tacrolimus ointment, advised to use sun protection, and she improved the skin. Two years later, she returned with symptoms of scalp discomfort and itching, along with longitudinal nail ridging. Her scalp was notably worse on sunny days, and it mostly affected the central part, where the sun is able to penetrate the best. She reported worsening of the scalp symptoms in the summer, but improvement in the winter. A biopsy showed lichen planopilaris, and trichoscopy showed classic features of lichen planopilaris with perifollicular erythema, 
and periflicular scaling. And this was notable along the central part where the sun could be more exposed to the scalp. So the authors propose this term actinic lichen plano pilaris to describe this patient with actinic lichen planus, who then went on to develop actinic lichen plano pilaris. She was treated with high potency topical steroids, asked to limit sun exposure, and she improved. So a nice case of this potential diagnosis of actinic lichen plano pilaris. What is actinic lichen planus? Well, lichen planus is a type of lichen, is a type of itchy rash. Actinic lichen planus is a photosensitive variant of lichen planus that often affects younger patients with darker skin types. It can be children and young adults that are often affected. In the literature, it goes by a whole bunch of different names. And so if you're searching for literature on actinic lichen planus, you might also want to search under actinic lichen planus, lichen planus subtropicus, lichen planus tropicus, summertime actinic lichenoid eruption. You might search under lichen planus atrophicus annularis, or you might search under lichenoid melanodermatosis. So lots of different names for the exact same thing. We don't know the cause of actinic lichen planus, but patients usually have darker colored skin. This patient in this report was from Sri Lanka, had type 5 darker colored skin, but patients with actinic lichen planus often have um, a background that includes uh, origins from East Africa, the Middle East, Indian origin. They have actinic lichen planus on sun-exposed sites. They flare in the summertime, they remit in the winter, and that's a very typical story. So in diagnosing actinic lichen planus, you see these darker colored plaques on the face, on the arms, on the bottom of the top of the feet, if their feet are exposed to sun. But what's important is most patients don't have mucosal involvement in the mouth. They don't have nail involvement with actinic lichen planus. And when you look in the literature, there's a number of nice reports of actinic lichen planus. Here's a report from JAD Case Reports 2018 showing these annular plaques on sun-exposed sites and biopsies of these confirm the diagnosis of lichen planus. So all in all, this patient had features of actinic lichen planus and actinic LPP. A nice report. I think we'll be thinking a lot more about this particular subtype. Again, it may not be that all patients with sun-exposed flares of their LPP fit the term actinic lichen plano pilaris. And so a 65-year-old white woman who finds in the summertime when she gets a burn that LPP seems to flare, I think we have to think twice about whether this is really appropriately termed actinic lichen plano pilaris. It's probably not. Actinic lichen plano pilaris for now is probably an appropriate term whereby there's a clear flare in the summer months. There's a patient with a background of darker colored skin. There's evidence of actinic lichen planus on history. It doesn't have to be, but that certainly helps the diagnosis. And there's an improvement in wintertime. What's unusual about this particular patient from Sri Lanka is her LP was itchy. Many patients with actinic LP don't have itching. Um, and she had nail involvement. Most patients with actinic LP don't have nail involvement. It's not impossible. She also had lichen plano pilaris, so maybe she does have a rare variant where she has nail involvement. But as you're thinking about actinic lichen planus of the skin, remember most patients don't have mucosal involvement, they don't have itching, and they don't have nail involvement. But that's most, not all. So we move now to a really important study of folliculitis decalvans and the microbiology of the skin microbiome in patients with folliculitis decalvans. A very nice study by Moreno Arones from Sergio Vano's group. Uh, this is a group from Spain who 
has a very important role in our understanding of many different types of dermatologic issues. And I'd like to review two of Dr. Fano's group's recent publications, which help us understand a little more about what's going on in folliculitis decalvans and a changing story of what's going on. New data is suggesting to us that folliculitis decalvans is more complex than just a story of Staph aureus. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, someone says to you, what causes folliculitis decalvans? You might say, well, some kind of local immune dysfunction against Staph aureus bacteria that resides in the hair follicle, causes pustules, and anti-staphylococcal medications treat the disease. So there's some truth to that, but what we're realizing now is it's not entirely a story of Staph aureus. And we'll take a look at how this story is now changing. So folliculitis decalvans is a scarring alopecia which affects many areas of the scalp, but often affects the vertex, the back of the scalp in men. It can affect women. Patients have itching and burning and pustules. It looks like a folliculitis when it starts. And so not uncommonly, patients go on years and years diagnosed as a folliculitis. And it responds to treatments for folliculitis, responds to antibiotics, responds to topical steroids, responds to isotretinoin. So it is a folliculitis. It just happens to be a special type of scarring folliculitis. So a new study from Spain sets out to examine the follicular microbiota, the organisms, both bacterial and fungi, residing in hair follicles in patients with folliculitis decalvans compared to controls. Are they different? And how is the immune response differing in patients with folliculitis decalvans? So the authors conducted a study of 10 patients with folliculitis decalvans. Scalp biopsies were taken from affected areas and healthy areas, and the microbiome was examined. So how do you examine the microbiome? Well, one way is to take out skin, send it off, try to culture up organisms. That's very difficult to do because different organisms require different culture media, different broth and soup to grow them. And so the modern way of trying to identify organisms is by next generation sequencing, where we actually look at the the genetics of the organisms that are in there in your biopsy specimens. And you can, by figuring out the genetics of, of the organisms that are living there, you can figure out what's, what bacteria are there. You can figure out what fungi are there. And that's indeed what the, organism, what the authors did. The authors also wanted to, knew, to know how the immune system differs. And so they took peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs, from patients. And they looked at how patients' immune cells spit out different cytokines when their blood cells are incubated with different antigens and different stimulatory agents, including PMA, ionomycin. These are common agents that stimulate immune cells. And they also incubated the patient's immune cells with various bacterial antigens to see what kind of cytokines could be released. And they measured interleukin-8, IL-1 beta, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor, IL-12, P70, and interleukin-10, common cytokines that uh, have an important role in the immune system response to um, bacteria, fungi, and, and other aspects. So there was 10 patients in this study, eight men, two women. The mean age was 37.6 years. There was a significant difference in the bacteria of folliculitis decalvans hairs and healthy hairs. The most fe frequent bacteria found in biopsies from folliculitis decalvans were staph, cutibacterium, bacteroides, and many, many other bacteria as well. Staph species represented about 25% of the total follicular count in folliculitis decalvans, compared to just 
in healthy follicles. So there's certainly a lot of Staph aureus in Folliculitis de Calvans biopsies. And so if you imagine yourself walking on the scalp of a patient with Folliculitis de Calvans, and you dive into a hair follicle of Folliculitis de Calvans containing area, one out of every four bacteria you meet are going to be Staph aureus. If you walk on the scalp of normal unaffected scalp from a patient that doesn't have Folliculitis de Calvans, you'll see Staph species but one out of every 20 bacteria you meet are going to be staph. So staph are certainly overrepresented represented in Folliculitis de Calvans. The staph species that you meet in Folliculitis de Calvans are not unusual. They're not containing antimicrobial resistance genes. They're not MRSA. They're not vancomycin resistant. They're not these super virulent species of Staph aureus. They're the regular Staph aureus living there. And so they don't show any acquired resistance mechanisms. The most prevalent fungi in Folliculitis de Calvans biopsies were Malassezia restricta, Globosa, Sym Sympodialis. And as we'll see in a minute, those don't seem to play a role in Folliculitis de Calvans. But fungi like these Malassezia species, are common on the scalp. So it's not surprising that we meet them when you look at the microbiome of the scalp. So the total number of bacteria didn't differ in Folliculitis de Calvans compared to controls, but the types of bacteria did differ. And in the world of microbiome research, we say that the alpha diversity was similar, but the beta diversity was different. And we'll take a look at what this means in a minute. So when the researchers took a closer look at the types of bacteria, they found that there was an increased presence of Staph aureus, but there was an increased presence of the Firmicutes phylum. And there was bacteria of the Lacnospheraceae family and the Ruminococcaceae family. So there was many different organisms that were present in the scalp of Folliculitis de Calvans. In healthy hair follicles, there was different bacteria that were present. Actinobacteria, phylum, were significantly overrepresentative in the healthy scalp. And so that's really important. There's different bacteria that are present in Folliculitis de Calvans containing areas and different bacteria in the normal scalp. And so the authors point out that some aspects of the immune system are quite normal in Folliculitis de Calvans, but some aspects are abnormal, and we'll take a look at this. So when the authors took out PBMCs, or the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from patients and controls, and dropped PMA on those cells or ionomycin on those cells, they found that Peripheral blood mononuclear cells from patients with Folliculitis de Calvans and healthy controls release cytokines normally in both situations. So the peripheral blood mononuclear cells in, follicular, in Folliculitis de Calvans are functioning pretty normally in most cases. They expressed TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, IL-1-beta, pretty similarly in response to PMA and ionomycin. But when bacterial antigens were presented to peripheral blood mononuclear cells, there was a difference and a reduction in what those peripheral blood mononuclear cells could release. They released less IL-10 in response to bacterial antigens. They released less IL-6. They released less TNF-alpha. So the authors propose that there's evidence for immune exhaustion. They propose this concept that in Folliculitis de Calvans, the immune system is constantly under pressure to be on patrol for these bacterial antigens that when they're presented with bacterial antigens, just not able to mount the same level of cytokine release. So they propose this term immune exhaustion. This is an important paper for us to all be aware of. For years, we've come to believe that Folliculitis de Calvans is related to Staph aureus, 
this paper reminds us that it is related to Staph aureus, but it's probably not so simple, that it's related to many bacteria. And so the authors point out that many studies in the past have relied on taking samples of pustules from the scalp and growing them in the incubator, but the reality is, is that there are many organisms in the scalp that live deep down in the scalp, they live in the skin, they're not found in those pustules. And so the techniques we've used in the past for evaluating pustules maybe don't capture the entire spectrum of bacteria that live in the scalp of patients with folliculitis decalvans. And so now we have these different techniques which allow us to analyze the genetics of the bacteria and the fungi that live in the scalp, and we can get a clearer picture of the follicular microbiome. And this really hasn't been well studied in folliculitis decalvans. So what are the key points here? Well, there's no statistically significant difference between the total bacteria and fungi in healthy hair follicles compared to folliculitis decalvans. So the so-called alpha diversity is the same. So it's not that folliculitis decalvans is just overgrowing with bacteria. No, it's that the bacteria are different in the hair follicle. And there are many differences in the type of bacteria that are found. There's an overrepresentation in certain types of groups, and especially this Firmicutes group, the Staph aureus group. There's a very specific group of organisms that live in folliculitis decalvans hair follicles, and that's called the microbiome signature. And there's a different group of organisms that live in the healthy scalp. The reasons aren't clear. It's not well understood. Why is there these different groups of organisms? Is there something special about the skin that allows these bacteria to grow? We don't understand it all yet. There's not really a difference in the fungi present in healthy scalp versus folliculitis decalvans scalp. So the story of folliculitis decalvans is a story in some ways of local immune dysregulation, perhaps changes in barrier function, follicular barrier function, changes in immune privilege and bacteria, but it's probably not a story of fungi. So we probably shouldn't be focusing a lot of attention on some kind of story of malassezia fungi. It's probably not. But there's certain bacteria like the Firmicutes phylum that are associated with folliculitis decalvans. There appears to be a dysbiosis. There's an alteration in the follicular microbiome in folliculitis decalvans. We don't know why. The Firmicutes bacteria phylum are found in the human gut. They're found in the oral cavity. They're found in perianal skin. Why these are taking up home in hair follicles is not clear. And certain members of the Firmicutes phylum seem relevant. The Lacnospiraceae family, the Ruminococcaceae family. These are biomarkers the authors propose of the disease. And so what the authors mean by a follicular signature is if you do this genetic analysis of microsequencing to look at the bacteria that live in, a, in an area of the scalp and Oh, it comes out showing that, wow, there's Staph aureus and Firmicutes and different organisms. You can actually say by looking at the printout of what's living there, hey, that, that may be suggestive of folliculitis decalvans. And if your genetic analysis comes out with different bacteria altogether, cutie bacterium and other bacteria, you might be more likely to say, hey, that's a normal scalp. So there's these microbiome bio, signatures that um, may exist, whereby uh, understanding the bacteria that live in a certain area, we might have a clue about the disease. The peripheral blood mononuclear cells from folliculitis decalvans respond pretty normally to stimulants like PMA and inomycin, but they don't respond normally to bacterial antigens. When you present bacterial antigens to the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from patients with folliculitis decalvans, those immune cells say, I'm tired. They do not release as much IL-10, IL-6, TNF-alpha. They are tired. And so there may be a component of immune exhaustion from chronic 
bacterial stimulation. So Dr. Vano's group, Moreno Aroni's study of 2023, ties in very nicely with the group's 2021 study. And we really can't leave this 2023 study without talking about the 2021 study. So I'll just mention it briefly. I think if you are studying folliculitis decal vans and you want to understand more about the disease, there are some key studies which you need to know. And Sergio Vano's 2023 study I just reviewed with you in the Journal of Dermatology. And this, this study from 2021 in the JAD are important studies to know. You may be aware that folliculitis decalvans is changing in terms of how we think about the disease. We used to think about it as a disease with pustules on the back of the scalp, and you treat it with antibiotics, you treat it with isotretinoin. But now we're realizing that that classic form is what we call the neutrophilic stage. Some forms of folliculitis decalvans change over time into a less pustular form and more of a form with perifollicular redness. And when you biopsy it, it shows lichenoid changes that kind of look like lichen planopilaris. That's called the lichenoid stage. Or the lichen planopilaris folliculitis decalvans phenotypic spectrum. So we're realizing now that folliculitis decalvans has two stages. It usually goes from stage one to stage two, but they can go back and forth. But there's a classic pustular stage that looks like the textbooks. That's called the neutrophilic stage. And then there's the lichenoid stage, which looks like lichen planopilaris under biopsy. And so in this 2021 study, Sergio Vano's group looked more closely at this lichenoid stage and how it compares to the classic folliculitis decalvan stage. They compared five patients with each. And what they found is that there was a higher level of staph aureus in the classic folliculitis decalvan stage compared with the lichenoid folliculitis decalvan stage. The levels of staph aureus were more than 20% of the total bacterial composition in the typical folliculitis decalvans neutrophilic stage, but less than 20% in the lichenoid stage, or the LPP, phenotypic spectrum stage. And all in all, the authors of that 21, 2021 study proposed that Staph aureus is a key biomarker to distinguish the neutrophilic classic stage from the lichenoid stage. And again, the Staph aureus in the 2021 st study didn't show any particular resistance patterns. And so all in all, the authors in 2021 showed that there's certain bacteria, especially Staph aureus, that are more common in the neutrophilic stage and certain bacteria that are more common in the lichenoid stage. And so what are these bacteria? Well, in the neutrophilic stage, there's Staph aureus, there's Firmicutes, and there's others. In the lichenoid stage of folliculitis decalvans, you don't see Staph aureus. You see a whole bunch of other organisms, Lachnospiraceae, and others. And so there's this microbiologic signature that seems to be present in the lichenoid stage and the neutrophilic stage. So taken together, what this tells us, these two studies tell us, is that if you have a biopsy and you tell me the microbiome that's living in that biopsy, and you see Firmicutes, you see Staph aureus, you might be more likely to say, hey, that's a microbiome signature of folliculitis decalvans. And then if you say, you know, there is Staph aureus, but there's not much. There's a lot of Lachnospiraceae. There's a lot of Robinsoniella. Then you might be more likely to say, hey, this may be the lichenoid stage of folliculitis decalvans. So we're coming to understand more about this microbiome signature. <laughs> 
So we don't know why this is occurring. There could be altered skin barrier function, hair follicle barrier function, some kind of local immune dysregulation that allows staph to grow. It's not these super resistant, virulent staph that are setting up shop and growing in hair follicles. It's the regular run-of-the-mill staph that says, let's grow here. We don't know why this is, but there's this dysbiosis that's occurring. And it's not a single bacteria that's involved. There's many different bacteria that are saying, let's grow here. Firmicutes, Staph aureus, and others. It's not simply a story of Staph aureus alone, which we once thought. And so the authors propose, and others as well in this growing literature, that there's two stages of folliculitis decalvans. In stage one, the neutrophilic stage, there's an increased colonization with Staph aureus, the regular run-of-the-mill Staph aureus. Perhaps there's some immune dysfunction. Perhaps there's some alteration in the hair follicle that provokes Staph to grow there. There's some inflammatory response against Staph, which involves neutrophils. There's lots of pus. There's lots of destruction. And due to all that destruction of hair follicles, there's a collapse of immune privilege. Follicular antigens are being exposed. Hair follicles are busting up. And the immune system now triggers a different response, a lichenoid response against the hair follicle. And this is stage two. So in stage one, the immune system is going after Staph aureus and other bacteria. In stage two, the hair follicle is busting up and the, the immune system is going after the hair follicle and there's a lichenoid immune response. The immune system is going, 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 going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there's an immune exhaustion. And so the immune system is less able to respond to bacterial antigens in the scalp. And so there's this immune exhaustion. And so in a model of Staph aureus, we see these two stages. First, there's some barrier dysfunction or immune dysfunction that allows Staph and other bacteria to set up shop. That's the neutrophilic stage. There's pustules, there's crusts. Stage two involves a lichenoid stage. There's collapse of immune privilege, there's immune exhaustion, there's damage to the follicle, and there's mixed bacteria that set up shop, like Lachnospiraceae and others. So this is important to us because in the neutrophilic stage, you use antibiotics, you use clindamycin, rifampin, doxycycline, you might use isotretinoin, you use the medication which go after bacteria like Staph aureus and go after neutrophilic responses. This is where you might use dapsone, isotretinoin. In stage two, where you have this lichenoid change in the scalp, which is mimicking lichen plano pilaris, you might use traditional immunosuppressants like steroid injections, like topical steroids, like hydroxychloroquine, tofacitinib, other JAK inhibitors, tacrolimus, doxycycline that shut down lymphocytic immune responses. So a really nice paper. I think that our view of folliculitis decalvans is changing. I would encourage you to check out those very nice studies by Dr. Vano's group, which is changing how we think about folliculitis decalvans. These microbiome studies are really important. And our textbooks will be changing that folliculitis decalvans is not just a study of blah, 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 Staph aureus, blah, 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 local immune dysregulation. It's a more complex story of many different bacteria and a change in that microbiome over time. Finally, we talk about dissecting cellulitis and the use of TNF inhibitors in the treatment of dissecting cellulitis, published in Clinical Experimental Dermatology. So dissecting cellulitis is this scarring alopecia that often affects young patients, 20, 25. They present with bogginess in the scalp that are draining pus. It can be smelly and it can be quite disfiguring and it has a severe impact on quality of life. It appears that dissecting cellulitis is due to a change in the 
follicular wall that leads to a collapse of it, as well as various aspects of immune dysregulation. Dysregul it's very closely related to hidradenitis separativa. The first line agents in dissecting cellulitis are isotretinoin and antibiotics, but if those fail, TNF inhibitors, prednisone, incision and drainage can be considered. Those are second line agents. Third line agents would include IL-23 inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, dapsone, and other agents as well. But authors from France set out to look at how well TNF inhibitors work in patients with dissecting cellulitis that failed isotretinoin, failed antibiotics. They looked at the efficacy of TNF inhibitors according to a five-point scale. They looked at how TNF inhibitors change the number of inflammatory nodules, the number of abscesses. They looked at the dermatology quality life index. Is it improving quality of life? Is it improving pain? And it is, is it improving how satisfied patients are with the treatment? So there were 26 patients in this study, 25 males, one female. Not, not unusual, dissecting cellulitis often affects males more commonly than females, but can affect females. The mean age of onset was 24 years, an elevated body mass index was present in 42% of patients, and 53% were smokers, three of them using cannabis. So I think that's interesting. We know that dissecting cellulitis has many risk factors. Obesity and smoking may be uh, known risk factors for um, dissecting cellulitis. So that's important to keep in mind. TNF blockers were introduced as a third line treatment in 24 of those 26 patients. In other words, most of those patients started isotretinoin and antibiotics. They started with the traditional treatment protocol, but these treatments were ineffective. In 92% of patients, they had been on antibiotics. 65% of patients had been on isotretinoin, which is traditionally the first-line agent for dissecting cellulitis. 11% had been on oral corticosteroids. So 26 patients, 5 were on adalimumab, 21 were on infliximab. The median treatment duration, the mean treatment duration was 19 months. I think that's important because these patients are being followed for quite a long time, almost two years. So what were the results in these 26 patients being treated with TNF inhibitors, adalimumab and infliximab? Well, the global assessment showed an improvement from a rating of three out of five down to one out of five. The median number of inflammatory nodules decreased from seven down to 0.5. The median number of abscesses decreased from 1 to 0. The dermatology quality life index score improved from 10 to 8. And the pain severity reduced from 6 to 1. Overall, the median treatment satisfaction was 7 out of 10. 69% of patients continued the TNF inhibitor. 31% of patients stopped. Some patients stop for various reasons. One patient stopped for optic neuritis. One patient stopped for liver enzyme elevation. Two patients stopped because they were in remission. Three demonstrated moderate efficacy and stopped. And one patient was lost to follow up. So many of the patients, almost 70%, continued this treatment. So all in all, this was one of the largest series of TNF inhibitor use in dissecting cellulitis. It shows that TNF inhibitors like adalimumab and infliximab improved quality of life, improved abscessy numbers, improved pain scores, and overall patients were pretty satisfied. It is interesting to note that the, the dermatology quality of life index decreased from 10 down to only 8, even though the average satisfaction was 7.25 out of 10. I think that's really important. And if you look at the Dermatology Quality of Life Index, it's a measure of quality of life. And it's not specific to dissecting cellulitis, but it measures quality of life, how embarrassed people are, uh, how satisfied they are with their ability to work, their ability to participate in hobbies and sports, their sexual health, 
how much does the treatment interfere with their activities of daily life? So the DOQI, or the Dermatology Quality Life Index, gives a, a snapshot of how people feel about their life. So even though the TNF inhibitors were felt to be a pretty good treatment, 7.25 out of 10, you can see that many aspects of impaired health still remained. And that shows us that even though abscesses are going away, even though pain is going away, there are still aspects of um, impaired quality of life that are present. Some of these areas on the scalp are still scarred. They're still disfiguring. Patients still feel embarrassed. They still may feel uh, that there's limitations that have come about from this permanent scarring caused by the dissecting cellulitis. So I think that's really important for us to keep, keep in mind. And it supports a notion that early treatment is really important to prevent that disfiguring scarring. But overall, this data supports the use of TNF inhibitors like adalimumab and infliximab in the treatment of dissecting cellulitis in patients that don't respond to conventional treatments. I think it's a really exciting time for dissecting cellulitis. This is a challenging condition to treat. We often start with isotretinoin and antibiotics, and some patients do well. We look to the literature on hydradenitis separativa to give us some idea about how to treat dissecting cellulitis. And that's where a lot of the, the literature came for using TNF inhibitors. 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago, they started using TNF inhibitors in hydradenitis. And that's where these agents started to be used in dissecting cellulitis. And now there's these new agents, the IL-17, IL-23 inhibitors used in hydradenitis separativa, and now we're starting to look at those in dissecting cellulitis as well. There's a lot of promising treatments on the horizon for dissecting cellulitis. And certainly, this is a nice reminder that these biologic agents have an important role in dissecting cellulitis. And this study is really important because it teaches us that, sure, these biologic agents work in some cases. Patients like them. They're generally well tolerated. There are side effects. One patient had optic neuritis. One patient had liver enzyme elevation. They're expensive. They're not always covered. But we need to act quickly, because even if we do gain control of the disease, many patients find that, yeah, my disease is better, but my quality of life is the same. You improve my quality of life a bit, you didn't improve it that much. I'm glad my pain is better, I'm glad the pustules are better, I'm glad the abscesses are better, but my quality of life is still not great. So I think we have to have a low threshold for moving on that you know, we use the antibiotic, we use the isotretinoin. If um, patient's improving, great. But if we're seeing new sinus tracts, if we're seeing new areas of hair loss, if we're seeing ongoing abscesses, we've got to move on. Of course, we have to culture pustules to see if there's secondary infection. Of course, we have to make sure we have the right diagnosis. We're not missing, you know, an unusual tinea capitis. We're not missing an unusual diagnosis. But we have to move on, that if a patient's failing isotretinoin and antibiotics, let's talk about whether we need to use uh, an anti-TNF agent. Let's talk about whether an IL-17 or IL-23 agent can be used off-label. I think we need to move on. That's how we're going to improve outcomes for patients. That's how we're going to lead patients to feel that I went on this treatment, I improved, and I've got many aspects of my life back. I feel more confident, and my quality of life is improved from a 10 to a uh, 1 or a 0, not from a 10 to an 8. I think that's a really important message of this study, that, um, that there's a lot more to treatment outcomes than just um, shutting off the disease. So TNF inhibitors are a second-line agent in dissecting cellulitis still, but I think the speed at which we jump from first line to second line agents has to be in the order of 
six to nine months in some cases, not three to four to seven years. So I think that's an important message. I want to thank you for joining me for this first episode of season four. It's nice to be back. I want to thank everyone for the comments that I've received uh, since season three ended. I appreciate all your comments. I'm really delighted to, to know that this podcast helps many and that uh, the stories that you've shared and the people that share stories about listening to the podcast at various times, driving, walking the dog, etc., cetera, um, patients that they've influenced you. I appreciate it a lot. So thanks for all the comments that you've sent in. We've reviewed the challenges in scalp biopsies. We reviewed that in 16 of 100 biopsies, expert dermato dermatopathologists couldn't agree was this scarring or non-scarring. And I reviewed with you some strategies for dealing with tough biopsies. When you have tough cases, you can take more biopsies, more cuts. You can take more history. You can perform more of a physical examination. You can do more stains, including elastin stains and direct immunofluorescence. We talked about the risk of retinopathy with hydroxychloroquine, the 2.7% increased risk of retinopathy when we follow the current guidelines of five milligrams per kilogram or less. Most patients have asymptomatic retinopathy if they're going to develop it. And the risk of moderate to severe retinopathy is probably 1.1% after 15 years. We talked about the risks associated with uh, low-dose naltrexone, the dysfunction in sleep in particular. How well does it work? Well, it's not clear, but let's keep LDN on the list of treatments for FFA and LPP for now. The 2017 study by Strazula and colleagues, just four patients, suggests that yes, it helps inflammation and helps itching. The 2020 study by Lajvardi suggests it doesn't do a thing. But here we have a study of 26 patients that says it might do something. So let's keep it on the list. Let's study it more. Let's bring more controls into the study. We talked about a new variant of lichen planopilaris called actinic LPP a patient of darker colored skin from Sri Lanka having actinic lichen planus of the skin going on to develop actinic lichen planopilaris of the scalp. She had this LPP presentation in the central part. And so let's talk more about sun exposure and LPP and what this variant might mean. But let's be careful about diagnosing actinic LPP in every LPP patient that says, I'm worse this summer, doc. Uh, I think we have to be careful uh, to use that term appropriately. For now, we probably need to use LPP, the actinic LPP variant in patients with uh, darker colored skin that have clear tendencies towards actinic LP, um, not just everyone that flares in the summer. But I think we've got to talk more about it. That's the key here. Um, there are some patients that improve their inflammatory scalp conditions with ultraviolet radiation. And so let's not forget about those and what this means. Let's continue to study the wonderful world of the electromagnetic spectrum and how it influences immunologic disease. We talked about another wonderful study by Dr. Vano's group, looking at the microbiome in folliculitis decalvans. This is a fascinating subject and an emerging topic. I think what we can agree upon is that Folliculitis decalvans is not a tightly packaged story of Staph aureus. It's a complex story that differs whether you're talking about the classic neutrophilic stage or the lichenoid stage. So folliculitis decalvans has two stages, at least. In the neutrophilic stage, go ahead and talk about Staph aureus. Go ahead and talk about Firmicutes. There's certain organisms that live in stage one. There's certain organisms that live in stage two, Lachnosporaceae being one of them, but there's others. But there's a microbiome signature in stage one and a different microbiome signature in stage two and a different microbiome signature yet in healthy hair follicles. Fascinating subject. But when you see a patient with folliculitis decalvans, what you need to decide, is this the neutrophilic stage where I can use antibiotics and isotretinoin 
Or is this the lichenoid stage where I might use topical steroids, steroid injections, hydroxychloroquine, tacrolimus? And finally, we talked about the use of TNF inhibitors for dissecting cellulitis. Adalimumab and infliximab helped 26 patients or so with dissecting cellulitis. And patients were pretty satisfied. 7 out of 10 rating. That's a pretty good rating for tough to treat dissecting cellulitis. Remember, these were not typical dissecting cellulitis. This was highly refractory dissecting cellulitis that didn't respond to isotretinoin, didn't respond to antibiotics. And patients gave it a 7.25 out of 10 rating. Pretty good score. But what this study reminds us is that even though patients were pretty satisfied with how the treatment worked, quality of life was still somewhat poor in these patients. So a reminder that we need to treat dissecting cellulitis early and aggressively, that a few steroid injections and some topical clindamycin, and we'll see you back in four months, six months, nine months, it's probably not the right approach to treating dissecting cellulitis. But we need to treat aggressively if the patient is in agreement and the physician clinician is comfortable. We need to treat it aggressively. And we need to consider, should we be starting isotretinoin? Should we be starting antibiotics? I'll see you back in two or three months. We'll see how things are going. And if things are improving, great. If things aren't improving, maybe we need to go down the treatment ladder onwards to second-line agents, which include oral prednisone, which include TNF inhibitors, which include incision and drainage. So a really helpful study. Thank you again so much for joining me for today's episode. I hope this was helpful for you. I'll look forward to seeing you again next week for Season 4, Episode 2, where we'll talk about a potpourri of different studies from the past few months in this fascinating field of hair loss. Thanks again for joining me today.